Hello and welcome. I am Exilight and this is my channel. Today we're going to talk about a person who went missing without a trace in the Joshua Tree National Park. It's a little bit longer than usual, so get yourself something to drink, get cuddled in, get comfortable. And just before we start, if you would please give this video a thumbs up, I would appreciate it. And if you are not already subscribed and you would like to be, please do so. And if you would like to be notified when my content goes live, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. It's all free. It's all worth it. All right. This is a story about Bill Owasco. In June of 2010, Bill Owasco flew from his home in suburban Atlanta to LA, California, where he stayed in a condominium owned by a friend of his. His plan was to go to Joshua Tree National Park and hike for several days. Owasco was 66 years old. He was an avid jogger. He was a Vietnam vet, and he was a longtime fan of the Desert West. A family photo of Owasco standing at the summit of Mount San Jacinto, another popular hiking destination in California, shows a man with a salt and pepper mustache looking fit, prepared, perfectly comfortable, and ready to take on the outdoors. Bill had written a rough itinerary and left it behind with his girlfriend, Mary Winston. It featured multiple destinations, both inside and outside of the park. The first hike scheduled was on Thursday, June 24th, and it was meant to be a loop out and back from a remote historical site known as Carey's Castle. Carey's Castle is an old miner's hut built into the rocks. Carey's Castle is so archaeologically fragile that just to discourage visitors, the National Park Service does not even include it on its official maps. Mary, a retired mortgage broker, was very worried about that one hike. From what she had read, the site sounded too remote, too isolated. She thoroughly begged him to not go on that hike. She told him that she was worried about his safety. She did this so much that when Bill got to California, the first thing he did was buy a can of pepper spray as a joke to kind of reassure her. He said, don't worry. He would be all right. The thing that makes me wonder about the pepper spray is that kinds of dangers that one would be normally concerned about in the desert on a hike would be things like snakes, scorpions, maybe coyotes, possibly wild pigs, bobcats, not generally things that you would use pepper spray on, and when. Other dangers would be crevices, getting stuck between two rocks, maybe falling down and breaking something and being so far out and off a map that nobody would know you were there. None of which would the pepper spray help with. So I can't help but wonder if Mary innately was afraid by going so far into an isolated part of the park that he could accidentally run into people who were up to no good. The plan was that he was going to finish the hike no later than 5 p.m. That he was going to call Mary by 5 p.m. Then he was going to grab dinner in nearby Pioneer Town. But 5 p.m. came and went, and Bill hadn't called. Mary tried a cell phone several times, 
and went directly to voicemail. She knew that he might still be in a region of the park with limited access to cell phone service, but that thought didn't cause her to worry any less. Why would he be so late? Why wasn't he calling? As night fell on the west coast with no word from Bill, Mary tried to call someone at the park. But by then, Joshua Tree headquarters had closed for the day. Her only option was to wait. Early the next morning, before 8 a.m., Mary finally got through to the park rangers, and she explained her situation. And it went something like her boyfriend was missing, he was a solo hiker, he was presumably lost, somewhere around Carey's Castle. The rangers went immediately to the trailhead, but Bill's rental was not there. It was a 2007 Chrysler Sebring, and it was nowhere to be seen. What's more, the trail appeared to have had no visitors for at least a week. Perhaps Bill had changed his plans. Now, I'm not sure how they know that he hadn't been there for a week. Somebody might be able to tell us below. But I do know that in national parks, you oftentimes have to go in through entrances and sign in that you're there. And for hikers, there's oftentimes a book at the beginning of a trail. You sign in that you're there, the date, the time where you're going, etc. so that if anything does happen, there is at least a place to start to find you. Now, Joshua Tree is highly regarded among climbers for its very challenging boulder fields, but its proximity to civilization and its tame outer appearance have given it a reputation as an easy destination. It's not the sort of a place where a person can simply disappear, it feels like. One of the most heavily trafficked national parks in the United States, Joshua Tree, is only two hours from Los Angeles. Obviously, a huge city. It's an hour's drive southwest of the park to Greater Palm Springs which is an oasis known for its luxury hotels, its golf courses, the movie stars that went there, the parties they had. It's domesticated, unthreatening version of the desert. And it's what many visitors see last before they travel in to Joshua Tree's interior. So it can seem like this is very minor, friendly, forgiving kind of place. Dave Pileman, who is a former executive director of Friends of Joshua Tree, a climbing advocacy group, as well as a 19-year veteran of Joshua Tree Search and Rescue, also 71 years old, says that it looks kind of benign to a person who drives through it. But anyone who goes there knows that the park contains areas of unknown difficulty. He said that where there are large rocks leaning together, they form dangerous pits and caves. In other spots, apparently minor side canyons can take more than one hour to summit. And as I said, there are at least 120 abandoned mine shafts into which an unsuspecting a, a hiker that hasn't been there before, a hiker that's possibly new to hiking, could stumble and fall into. Pileman's involvement with Bill's case began soon after Mary called. As deputy planning chief, he was put in charge of the routes, the teams, and the search areas. At first, he said that Bill appeared to be a typical lost tourist, someone who goes out by himself, encounters a problem of some sort, fails to report back at the prearranged time, and eventually finds his way back into known territory. 
Park sees about 50 of those cases every year. But when he learned that Bill was a fit, accomplished hiker, it added to Pileman's confidence that he would be found quickly and perhaps even, quote, self-rescue by finding his way out. Carey's Castle was only one of several locations that Bill intended to see. Unfortunately, the list included sites as far away as the Salton Sea and the Mount San Jacinto area, each more than an hour's drive past the park. Rangers quickly established that Bill's National Park Pass had never been scanned at either of the park entrances. However, that wasn't definite proof that he hadn't been there. Sometimes if there's a long line of cars formed, members are waved through, but it meant that there was no record of his visit. Had Bill even gone to Joshua Tree? But there were a handful of other trails within the park that were featured on his list. There was Keys View, an overlook with the views of the San Andreas Fault, as well as the exposed summit of Quail Mountain, Joshua Tree's highest point, part of a slow transition into the park's mountainous western range. Pileman is quoted as saying, The thing I remember the most was the frustration of, how can this be? How can we have so much information about where he was going, or at least where he said he was going to go, yet we still can't find him? Then, on the afternoon of Saturday, June 26th, two full days after Bill failed to call Mary, the California Highway Patrol helicopter finally spotted Bill's car at the Juniper Flats trailhead, which was nearly a 90-minute drive from Carey's Castle trailhead. By this time, he would have been exposed to late June temperatures, which hovered in the mid-90s usually, probably with little food or water. Locating the car did indicate that Bill was where it had one point been inside the park, though, and the rapidly expanding search effort immediately shifted to Junior Per Flats. Now, a couple of things that are questionable here is that why would Bill drive 90 minutes past his destination? Why would he add that much time to a hike that was supposed to be a loop out? where he was supposed to be back by 5 p.m. Also, why would he take limited food and water? Well, because the hike he intended to go on was much shorter. So, one has to wonder what happened and made him change his mind or made him decide to skip the very first hike on his list of things he wanted to see. And of course, we'll never know that. Stretching west from Juniper Flats, where Bill's car was spotted, is an old unpaved road that begins with nothing special. There are chilling winds that whip down from the flanks of the Quail Mountains. And the park's famous boulder fields are nowhere even close. But as you continue down the dirt road, hikers are confronted with many decisions to make, many points of which they have to decide where to go, places where the trail diverges at junctions with other trails, or places where it comes across a wash or a dry stream bed. And as these decisions compound over time, these minor little decisions, left, right, right, left, straight, forward, left, right, forward, they give rise to a radically different situation than one would have if they were simply on a marked trail. An exposed 
cliff instead of a secluded valley, say, or a rattlesnake-filled canyon instead of a quiet plain. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If I ever go missing in Joshua Tree National Park, which, A, would be so unlikely that it would have to be foul play, B, my decision-making would never lead me towards rattlesnake-filled canyon. So if I happen to be found in one, there is only one excuse for this, and that would be foul play. Call the police. I would not be there. Okay? Did you write that down? Did you make that note? Thank you. The problem is anticipating what a stranger will do when confronted with these decision points in unfamiliar landscape is part of any search and rescue team's operations. But in recent years, technology in the form of what are called lost person behavior algorithms has been brought to bear on the problem. Now, keep in mind, this is not Bill's first time to Joshua Tree National Park. He's hiked there several times. He's not a new hiker. He's not a lost hiker. He's not an unfamiliar hiker. But let's continue with this. Some of the most widely used algorithms are those developed by Virginia-based search and rescue expert Robert, and I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I'm going to say Kester. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Robert Kester, who wrote the definitive, definitive book on the subject, Lost Person Behavior. Here's what he says. The basic premise is that the past predicts the future. While you can never pinpoint exactly where you think the missing person you're looking for is going to be located, because if you could, it would not be called a search. It would be called a rescue. By looking at previous cases, several dozens, hundreds of previous cases and the choices that were made in those cases, situations that are very similar, you can build a statistical model that identifies the most likely locations, the most likely choices that would be made. As Kester explains, Many lost hikers believe that they are headed in the right direction until when? Until it's too late. And they've been in the wrong direction. Sometimes they accidentally follow an animal trail that looks like a padded down new branch of the current trail they're on. Or they might divert downhill to a stream before winding onward through a series of ravines, ending in a dry wash. But by then, sometimes an hour or more has gone by, and the path forward is now nowhere to be seen. Now they're facing thick brush. Worse, Kester says, simply turning around sometimes can be impossible, as the route from which they came is camouflaged by rocks or brush. And now the hiker is lost. Although, can I add here that it seems that perhaps in some circumstances you might be able to see your own footsteps if it was sandy enough and wasn't too dry. But... Maybe those are the people that do find their way back out safely. Kester has assembled a database of nearly 150,000 search and rescue cases. From these, he has produced a series of algorithmic tools that can be applied to future situations, helping to estimate not just where the last person could be, but also the sequences, the choices they made, that led them 
to be there. Still, it's a high endurance detective case. Well trained searchers are needed. They will perform methodical eye movements to allow themselves to take in the full visual field. They scan continuously for any abnormalities in the landscape, which includes a footprint, broken branches, a discarded piece of clothing, the, the place where somebody looks like somebody sat down in the dirt, something that they might have dropped out of their pack. They must at all times be scanning and scanning and looking, which must be mentally exhausting. However, if they do find something like that, it could add to the suggestion that there was another decision point made. Kester's database and his algorithmic tool were put to heavy use during the Bill Owasco case. Under Pileman's guidance, search teams were sent from the location of Bill's car up to the top of Quail Mountain, south to Keysview, deep into Juniper Flats, and through a number of less likely but nonetheless possible areas in an exhaustive step-by-step -step elimination of the surrounding landscape. Everywhere they went, the question was the same. What would Bill do? Would he take the path that arcs gradually southwest toward the town of Desert Hearts Hot Springs? Or would he follow a dry wash that slowly fades into the landscape in a distant canyon? Would he have diverted from the trail altogether? Each search team was sent to test a different answer to those questions. By Saturday afternoon on June 26, volunteers were arriving from throughout Southern California, and an incident command post was established near a huge natural rock formation known as Cap Rock. There, a six by nine foot map of the area was taped together and layered with the team's daily GPS tracks and other routes of the helicopter flights. Every square inch, it seemed, had been covered. One team stumbled upon a red bandana at the foot of the Quail Mountain. Another reportedly saw lights one night on a ridge. A bloodhound was exposed to the clothes found in Bill's rental car, then brought to the trail. There were more helicopter flights, more hikes. Despite the impeccable logic, logic of lost person algorithms and the interpretive allure of the big data, Bill could not be found. So, what are the problems, the issues with Joshua Tree, as I would assume all wilderness locations would be, is that it's comprised of more than 1,200 square miles of desert. It has a clear and bounded border. Yet its interior is constantly changing. The landscape of hills, canyons, riverbeds, caves, alcoves, large enough to hide from human view, solid canyon walls, when you get up closer and see them, you can see that they are sometimes full of loose rocks, hiding crevices as large as living rooms. So the parks and these wilderness areas seem immeasurable at that point. And now in Bill's case, like Joshua Tree itself, it was becoming fractal that every place they would go to look 
would have something extra to look at if they went to go look at a rock formation that rock formation could be hiding a a mine and that mine could have been somewhere where he had sat under the rock formation to get out of the sun and fell into the mine it just kept becoming more and more piled on of where he could be the more the ground was searched and covered the more there was to look through and as Pete Carlson of the Riverside Mountain Rescue Unit put it he said if you haven't found them then there's some place you haven't looked yet however those of us interested in these types of cases happen to know that that isn't always true in fact many times it is not true you can search an area over and over and over and over you can have hundreds of searchers walk through the area you can have dogs helicopters search and rescue teams volunteers and a year later two years later that body will be found where hundreds of people hundreds of dogs dozens of helicopters have searched on July 5th 2010 11 days after Mary got through to those park rangers to report Bill missing the official search was called off regional resources had been exhausted the teams were broken up or were assigned elsewhere in the state Bill it was assumed simply could not have survived that long without food and water and clothes ill suited for the deserts extreme temperatures and after a while where else do you look and that's something I mention in many of these cases is that if you go missing in a national park or national forest the search for you is going to be limited to likely days sometimes weeks very seldom longer than weeks unless it's family but after that you are assumed dead you are assumed that you will never be found or that if you are found it's going to be your bones from animals that you had ran into but if you stop and think about this if he had come across some sort of wild animals the chances are pretty good that with all of this technology all of these people there would have been his clothing the items he took to hike with to climb with that there was nothing and in a lot of these cases there is nothing they just disappear without a trace and if you were someone or something prone to hunting humans there is no better place than a national forest or a national park because you know that the search will be limited they will accept no no proof they will think that's normal to have no proof to have no clothing and then that's over and then why sometimes do the bodies come back somehow and be in the exact same missing place well in my opinion that's because somebody then wants them to be found 
something then wants them to be found. And one of the reoccurring excuses for why people must have died is that they weren't dressed for the weather. This man is an avid hiker. He's in his 60s. He was in the military. He knew what clothes to bring. He'd been here several times. The idea that he wasn't addressed for the climate, in my opinion, just doesn't even make sense. Now Bill has been gone for 10 years. And in that time, something amazing has happened. Bill is still missing, but while the official search ended less than two weeks, the unofficial search never ended. A loose group of detectives, sleuths, people interested in cases like this, with no personal connection to Bill or Bill's family came together. They were backcountry hikers, outdoor enthusiasts, online obsessives, and they joined the hunt. They refused to give up on the man that they never knew. And as it happens, we live in something of a golden age for amateur investigations. Armchair detectives have their disposal an array of internet resources. Like a website called Web Sleuth. And it's a forum with over 140,000 registered users dedicated to examining unsolved crimes and their clues. And that includes missing person reports. Reddit, too, has become a gathering place for online detectives with multiple threads about the search for Bill Iwasco. The Iwasco search also contains many people willing to go and hike and search for him and take photos. It attracts dozens of commenters to an irregularly updated thread hosted by the Mount San Jacinto Outdoor Recreation Forum. There, avid hikers have collectively posted more than 500 times about Bill since May 2012, since the official search for Bill was called off. Strangers have cataloged more than a thousand miles of hiking routes with new attempts continued to this very day. This makes the search for Bill one of the most geographically extensive amateur missing searches and missing person searches in U.S. history. Bill will probably not be found alive. But these searchers believe that he will be found. Now, tracking down a lost person, however, is more than just an effort to solve a mystery. The intensity that many of these investigators, these armchair investigators, bring to their work suggests a fundamental discomfort with the idea of a disappearance in the 21st century. How is it possible that people are able to disappear in this day and age? Most, most everybody carries a cell phone. There are satellite photos. Most people at, let, let's say, Joshua Tree National Park, 
let's say if they're there for a hike, they're probably taking photos. And this is a well-known case. How can it be that he wasn't in a photo? He wasn't seen by somebody? Now, some people don't want to be found. And that happens too. But that isn't the majority of the cases. Then, Mike Milson comes along. And he becomes interested in Bill's case. It was nearly two years after Bill disappeared in the spring of 2012. Mike was a computer scientist by training. He knew that he possessed the technical skill that might shed light on Bill's fate. He informed many others that he had a decade's worth of work with law enforcement to track cell phone data. Nelson had also developed a forensic program called CellHawk, which was capable of turning raw cellular data and information into usable search maps. He said that my philosophy is the data says what the data says. It's as simple as that. As people probably know by now, cell phones ping radio towers on a regular basis. It's a kind of digital check-in to ensure that they can access the network they need. However, the ping also supplies information that can be used to estimate the distance, like how far a phone is from a given tower. This data can be formally requested by the police, for example, if investigators are trying to track a criminal or to locate a missing person. Using cell phone data in collaboration with law enforcement, Melson has cracked multiple missing person cases, including that of two teenage boys who disappeared in North Carolina. Pay, paying closer attention to the exact moment at which the boys' phones abruptly left the cellular network, Melson arrived at a macabre but accurate conclusion. The boys had driven into water. Acting on Melson's tip, the police found their bodies in a canal 50 miles away from the last tower pinged. And I have recently read that very story, which was extraordinarily interesting and also very, very sad. So it was just not the excitement or the prospect of solving a technical challenge that brought Melson into the hunt for Bill. In 2005, Melson and his wife Bridget read an article about Nita Mayo. She was an English-born mother of four who had disappeared in the Sierra Nevada. The Melsons immediately drove to Donald Vista where Mayo disappeared. They wanted to go help her family continue the search. Although to this day, Mayo's remains are missing. The case affected Melson so profoundly that he and his wife started a faith-based volunteer search and rescue service called Trinity Search and Recovery. Melson had been following the story of Owasco and his disappearance on and off, both through word of mouth and by searching and looking at the search and rescue community and through a blog called The Other Hand, which is written by Tom Mayhood. Mayhood, who is a former volunteer with the Riverside Mountain Rescue Unit and a retired civil engineer, demonstrated his considerable outdoor tracking abilities with the case of the so-called Death Valley Germans. After more than a year of grueling legwork in 2000, and nine, Mayhood and another searcher found the remains of the German family who disappeared in Death Valley 13 years earlier. Although Mayhood participated in the official, the official search for Bill Owasco, helping to clear the region around Quail Mountain, the case later became something of an obsession. Mayhood has since published more than 
80 blogs about Bill's disappearance, featuring several hundred photographs, meticulously logged GPS tracks, and numerous Google Earth files, all documented in this open-ended search. Included in Mayhood's mound of information were some cell phone records. These records revealed that at 6.50 a.m. on Sunday, June 27, 2010, three days after Bill had last spoken with Mary, his cell phone communicated with a Verizon tower just outside of the park's northwestern edge, above the town of Yucca Valley. This was the first time Bill's phone had registered with any tower since the morning of his disappearance and it suggested that his phone had probably been turned off until he got back at the end of his search so it would conserve the battery, or that he had been trapped somewhere where he just could not get service. The ping was, of course, a welcome clue. It shaped several routes during the official search operation, but it also presented a mystery. According to the data, Bill's phone was over ten and a half miles away from the tower at the time it pinged. This placed him so far beyond the official search area that when rescuers first learned of the ping in 2010, many simply blew it off. They didn't believe it. Between a three-day gap and the ping's unexpected location, it inspired a series of theories, counter theories, conspiracy theories that continue to be developed to this day. Perhaps the signal was distorted by early morning thermal effects as the sun rose, throwing off Bill's real position. Perhaps the Rocky Mountain landscape of Joshua's tree acted as a funhouse mirror. Maybe it splintered the signal's accuracy one jagged boulder to another. One commented that perhaps on the Mount San Jacinto Outdoor Recreation Forum that could have been a passing bird. Maybe its wings could have thrown off the signals. Others, more conspiracy-minded, suggested that the ping had been deliberately staged to mask the true reasons for Bill's disappearance. As for why his phone pinged only once that morning, there was one frustrating theory, and that was that his phone had been turned off or his battery was low, and he finally got to a point high enough where he knew that he could get a clear signal. So he turned his phone on, and his phone was hit by a barrage of messages, text messages. Where are you? How are you? Please call me. We're worried. And if his phone had been low on battery, it would have died immediately. Melsa went and explored the area where the ping had been pinged. And much of the area around it and he decided that it was possible that the original ten and a half mile number could not be verified. A spokesman for the Riverside Sheriff's Department said that the original cell data no longer exists, though. What's more, the ten and a half mile number apparently came from one signal technician. In other words, this hugely monumental, influential data, one that has now come to dominate the search for Bill Owasco, could in the end have been nothing more than a clerical error. Let's think about that for a minute. Something strange to me and 
I know you guys, you've probably thought of it by now too, before I even finished getting it out of my mouth. What if that one technician has something to do with it? What if that one technician went and pinged it off that tower intentionally? What if he hoped that the searchers would believe it and would move that direction? away from another direction perhaps or just to watch them get excited just to see them under his control no i'm not saying that this guy did it i'm i'm not i don't even take it don't take it that way. I'm saying allegedly only one person wrote down that there was a ping that just so happened to be during a huge manhunt and one of the biggest pieces of information that had to do with that huge manhunt and I'm saying that sometimes when people maybe do harm to other people, they enjoy getting involved in the investigation. I'm just saying. I'm not accusing him. Nelson drove to Joshua Tree in person so that he could explore the area, so that he could see Covington Flats, and that was just one of several possible sites where Owasco's ping could have originated from. And what he decided was that it could very well be that it was incorrect that Bill's phone could have been anywhere from a quarter of a mile further away to nearly right underneath the tower itself. But if you did factor in reflections off of mountains and rocks, that the ten and a half miles could be a very, very rough guide. Also, a spokesman for the Riverside Sheriff's Department said that the original cell data no longer exists and also that the 10.6 mile number apparently came from just one single technician. There was one person who wrote down that it had pinged. In other words, this huge chunk of evidence, this piece that so many other things were relying on, could simply have been an error. Now, I know the way you guys think, and so I'm sure that you've probably thought of this already, but it does seem strange to me that this one piece of information, this hugely influential point, was relied on by one person saying so. And I'm not pointing fingers, but if I were the police, I think and maybe they did. I think I should interview this person because was there was this false information he gave intentionally and I don't think that that's too much to ask to look into considering all the weight they were giving this this one piece of testimony. 
a man named Adam Marslin was quoted as saying that getting into missing person cases was a way for him to stimulate his brain. That he would go out hiking into remote regions of the park. He would go to an area known as Smith Water Canyon where he had logged more than 140 miles, often by himself, looking for Bill. Marsland, who is now 54 years old, was a pop musician and he lived in the suburbs of Los Angeles. He refers to himself as a desert rat. He said that he is used to taking long solo hikes in the Mojave. He said, I love being a musician, but it isn't an intellectual puzzle most of the time. Developing this hobby was like I wasn't a musician for a while. I could be a detective. For him, discovering Bill's case on Tom Hood's blog was life-changing. He said he was going through a period of time where he felt pretty shut in and bored and isolated. He just went down this rabbit hole into Tom's website and started developing theories of his own. Marslin has spent 20 expeditions going into the desert, at least that, looking for a man that he has never met in person. This case has touched several people, and they just can't shake it. And they keep going out and looking and looking. Marsden was talking about how he went on a trip once and he found a pit. He said it was enclosed by rocks and you couldn't really see from the side of it. He said he remembered thinking that this is exactly the kind of place where you would expect Bill to be. Some place where maybe he had fallen down and he couldn't get out. Maybe he had to get refuge, get out of the sun. He said that in his head he just couldn't leave until he had crawled in and gone all the way to the edge, the back edge of this pit to make sure that there was no remains of Bill in there. That he could go look down and see. And he said that while he was doing that he was terrified that he himself would fall into the pit and never be found. But the pit was empty. There was no clues. So Marzen started documenting his hikes for Mayhood Mahud's website. So he would post long well thought out reports over the course of four years. He said that when I pointed out that he is now one of the most experienced searchers with detailed knowledge of Joshua Tree's backcountry, he laughed, saying, I'm just one guy looking around. Maybe somebody else might do a better job. I'm just a guy that's going out. By May 2014, they figured that the total mileage accumulated in these unofficial searches by interested helpers had probably long surpassed the original search and rescue operation looking for Bill. Many people had gone into the most remote possible locations in Joshua Tree National Park and they realized that just weren't any clues that if they got lost out there maybe nobody would find them or maybe they would come up against whatever Bill's fate had been Mary Winston doesn't go out to Joshua Tree she says she she just can't. But she has faith that the people who are going out and volunteering are doing for her 
what she's unable to do for herself. But they're doing for Bill what she's unable to do for Bill. Mayhood has indicated in a blog post that his own search is going to have to start winding down. He said that there's just no place to look. There's just no stone that's been unturned that he can think of. But that if there's any new evidence at all, he'll be sure to put it on his blog. What is really interesting is that the response to one stranger's disappearance can turn into a whole online sleuthing group to the appeal of the big data, to the precision of where the signals are pinging off of, even to the power of prayer. But it can also lead to an embrace of an emotional realism that an acceptance that someone completely vanishing, even in the age of Google Maps and phones and helicopters and all that we have, you can completely disappear without a trace. Winston says that she appreciates the extraordinary efforts of the original search teams and those that continue to go out and look for her boyfriend, for Bill. The most important thing for her is not just the company. It's not just knowing that people are still searching, but that after all this time, People still care. Thank you for listening to this video. If you would, please give it a thumbs up. Share if you would like. If you are not subscribed and you would like to be, please go ahead and do that. If you'd like to be notified when my content goes live, I would appreciate that. Please go ahead and click that bell. Good night.